combating COVID in the context of true medical missionary work. And this uh, is put together by Med Missionary, which is led by uh, Dr. Joyce Cho and Mercy Ballard of the Years Restored Lifestyle Center. And I was privileged to take a uh, Med Missionary course here um, about a month ago. It was six weeks of, of, uh, of training through them uh, to be trained to function in a med missionary, medical missionary capacity um, to, help, to help others. And it was a real blessing to participate um, in, that, in that training. Um, so looking at uh, just the context of our lives, we were made in the image of God at, uh, at creation. And God created man in his own image. Male and female created he them from Genesis 1.27. That's a, that's a very um, high calling to, to know that we were made in the image of God. So we have his likeness and he has, has our likeness. <clears throat> There's resemblances between us. We're part of the same family. Sin has marred God's image. <clears throat> and through sin, uh, the divine likeness was... was um, challenged and marred and scarred and essentially obliterated. So we're a, a, a far cry from what um, he had intended for us when uh, we were created. <clears throat> so from education, page 15, uh, to restore in man the image of his maker, to bring him back to the perfection in which he was created, to promote the development of body, mind and soul that the divine purpose in his creation might be realized this was to be the work of redemption the object of education the great object of life <clears throat> so that that was the whole purpose um, of education was to restore man to god's image the medical missionary work uh, is an important part of that and it brings to humanity the gospel of release from suffering. So gospel is good news, the good news of release from suffering. It's the pioneer work of the gospel. It is the gospel practiced, the compassion of Christ revealed. Of this work, there is great need and the world is open for it. And I think it will become even more open for it. In all its bearings, it is to be in conformity with Christ's work. So when we do medical missionary work, we need to make sure that we're following the pattern that Christ laid out in his ministry and his work for doing that medical missionary work. Otherwise, it can't truthfully be called medical missionary work um, and will be uh, kind of a counterfeit. And we don't want to ever be involved with, with a counterfeit system or way of doing things. <clears throat> so true medical missionary work is of heavenly origin. <clears throat> It is powerful, it's humble, it's simple. Uh, for example, a fig poultice, that may be the Second Kings 5 um, annotation here. It's accessible to all, that means anybody can get it. It's not patented, it's not um, held exclusively by any one entity or person. <clears throat> um, it's accessible to all, it's freely available. It's safe, so there's no side effects or downsides to participating in it. And it makes use of the things of nature, things that God provided for us. And in that regard, it reveals the character of God. So true medical missionary work has these hallmark features as a part of it. <clears throat> so Christ was our example. Uh, he made use of the simple agencies of nature. While he did not give countenance to drug medication, he sanctioned the use of simple and natural remedies. <clears throat> to many of the afflicted ones who received healing, Christ said, sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee, John 5, 14. Thus he taught that disease is the result of violating God's laws, both natural and spiritual. The great misery in the world would not exist did men but live in harmony with the creator's plan. <clears throat> so he said, go and sin no more. Um, and by violating God's laws and commands, we put ourselves in, in harm's way. When instructing institutions 
uh, Mrs. White uh, said, our institutions were established that the sick may be treated by hygienic methods, discarding almost entirely the use of drugs. The Advent physician was challenged to seek altogether new methods of treating the sick. <clears throat> so methods outside of, of using uh, the drug modalities. Uh, there may be a place for uh, occasional and sparing use. She said discarding almost entirely the use of drugs. Definitely that was the direction um, that was uh, given to us by the prophet of God. So how do drugs work? Uh, the endless variety of medications on the market, the numerous advertisements, you see them all the time, of new drugs and mixtures, all of which claim to do uh, wonderful things, the miracle drugs. Kill hundreds where they benefit one. <clears throat> The, I believe it's the third leading cause of death is properly prescribed medication called iatrogenic causes. So we've been instructed how to proceed. God's servants should not administer medicines, which they know will leave behind injurious effects upon the system, even if they do relieve present suffering. It's interesting how fearful people are of pain. They want to avoid pain at all costs. Uh, pain is a part of healing. <clears throat> and if you're avoiding it at all costs, people will often um, relinquish themselves to the use of medications for instant immediate relief with potential long-term consequences. <clears throat> Words to the Christian physician uh, from Selective Messages 2, 283, the physician who depends upon drug medication in this practice shows that he does not understand the delicate machinery of the human organism. He is introducing into the system a seed crop that will never lose its destroying properties throughout the lifetime. I tell you this because I dare not withhold it. Christ paid too much for man's redemption to have his body so ruthlessly treated as it has been by drug medication. And to our uh, founding pioneers in the medical missionary work and the sanitarium work, but in no case are you to stand as do the physicians of the world to exalt allopathy above every other practice and call all other methods quackery and error. For from the beginning to the present time, the results of allopathy have made a most objectionable showing. There has been loss of life in your sanitarium because drugs have been administered and these give no chance for nature to do her work of restoration. Drug medication has broken up the power of the human machinery and the patients have died. The students in your institution, that is the Battle Creek Sanitarium, are not to be educated to regard drugs as a necessity. They're to be educated to leave drugs alone. That was the beginning of our, of our medical work and a marked departure of that is seen in the mainstream um, medical system of which uh, our church is a part today. There are very few and far between, but powerful uses of the, um, the God-given way of, of treating our bodies. So some results of rejecting um, the health message. So we have, we have the Israelites kind of paralleling with the, with the Adventist uh, message. We have the Exodus from, from Egypt and God gave them manna. And that manna sustained them throughout their entire wandering in the wilderness. Uh, it was the food that gave them the energy uh, and survived, allowed them to survive through that entire time. And during that period of time, the giving of the law was uh, happened at Sinai, and they ultimately re, uh, went to, arrived in Canaan. In 1844, uh, the Adventist faith uh, was born uh, out of the 2300 day prophecy completion. The health message was given to us through the uh, work of Ellen White and her inspiration from, from God. And the 1888 message of righteousness by faith was given during that period of time um, as well. And that brings us up to the present following the council um, that we should be following the counsel that was given um, at the beginning. <clears throat> so true medical missionary work uh, is uh, uh, the truth for this time. The third angel's message 
is to be proclaimed with a loud voice, meaning with increasing power as we approach the great final test. This test must come to the churches with the true medical missionary work, a work that has the great physician to dictate and preside in all it comprehends. Under the great head, we are to present God's word, requiring obedience to the system of Bible truth, which is a system of authority and power. Convicting and converting the conscience, the demand of the word to obedience is a life and death question. <clears throat> For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows, Matthew 24, 7 and 8. We've kind of been seeing this for years, and as we draw closer to the finish line, we'll see them intensify um, even uh, greater. <clears throat> so the acronym that Med Missionary uses that Joyce coined uh, is wholeness. It's... Uh, uh, similar to the acronym that you may be familiar with already called New Start, uh, and it has all the elements of New Start with one additional one. So we have water, the use of pure water, uh, both internally and externally in a hydro hydrotherapy kind of an application. We have healthy habits. <clears throat> healthy habits are very important. Um, I've said for years and years that uh, uh, diseases aren't so much a genetic component uh, running in families as the outcome of bad habits that run in families. So you tend to take on the culinary habits and lifestyle habits of your, of your parents. Um, you can certainly change from those um, <clears throat> habits, but they definitely are pre, um, predisposed to those habits. Pure oxygen, uh, just healthy air, good air <clears throat> uh, to breathe, pure air. Love, love of God, um, and love of your fellow man. And the one that New Start doesn't have as a part of it is your environment. And your environment is huge. There's lots of different things that are part of environment. We can include everything from electromagnetic uh, frequency uh, interference to noise interference to uh, toxins of both air and, and water. Uh, one that is uh, raising its head as being a very significant factor is um, uh, glyphosate, the primary ingredient in Roundup and other herbicides, uh, and we'll talk more about that later. Good nutrition. Good nutrition is, is a key part of this. Uh, we can see that uh, the environment actually plays a role in how we get that good nutrition as well. Um, exercise, we'll see, has a very uh, important component, and adequate rest in an environment that is conducive to rest, that is a low light environment, a low sound environment, a uh, comfortable environment, <clears throat> and then sunshine. Sunshine is key to activating our ability to process vitamin D, as well as uh, important in allowing us to <clears throat> also produce the proper amounts of melatonin and reset our biological clocks uh, by being awake and asleep at the proper times. <clears throat> So vitamin D, we'll kind of work from the bottom up here to start with. It, uh, one of the things that it does is stimulates uh, innate immunity and also modulates acquired immunity. So innate immunity is the immunity that you are able to um, have because you were born with it. Acquired immunity is acquired through challenge by external pathogens like uh, viruses and bacteria. If you've never been, if you've never encountered them before, your body builds an immune response to it, and that's called acquired immunity. And that's the uh, type of immunity that inoculations and vaccines attempt to um, attempt to tap into. So also it promotes the barrier um, uh, of integrity for the intestinal tract and the lungs and promotes autophagy. Auto means self, um, self eating essentially. So it, autophagy is the uh, autophagy is eating the, the bad bacteria, essentially what macrophages do. So macrophages are the white blood cells that, that eat or consume the bad um, bacteria, dead tissue, and things like that to remove them out of the body. Uh, the recommended, um, uh, recommending regular lab testing for vitamin D levels, especially northern climes, climates like we are, um, <clears throat> It's important to have adequate amounts of vitamin D. Uh, when my wife was tested for vitamin D levels uh, prior to 
having our children, uh, found out that she had the lowest levels that her obstetrician had ever seen in, in a person. She has an indoor job. She enjoys being outside, but for whatever reason, her, her vitamin D levels were very, very low. So if you need to do a supplement, um, uh, you should do that because it's important to, to keep those levels um, up high enough that your body can be uh, immune reactive in the proper ways, as well as um, uh, calcium uh, deposition in the bones requires vitamin D to do that. So sunshine is the, the primary way that our bodies acquire vitamin D through the skin. However, I mentioned uh, glyphosate as being a environmental factor that can cause disruptions. And one of those things that can disrupt is actually the production of vitamin D in people. It actually turns out that glyphosate levels can create in individuals phototoxicity of the skin. So they become more sensitive to burning and more sensitive to the heat, and thereby they cover themselves more. Um, and then in conjunction with sunscreens that may be toxic and have toxic elements carrying them into the cells and tissues, then uh, vitamin D is not adequately created by the body. <clears throat> when you're taking a vitamin D supplement, you will probably want to find one that is plant-based. There are uh, lichen-based uh, vitamin D supplements, vitamin D2 and D3. Uh, most vitamin D supplements actually come from the lanolin in wool, which is essentially the, the fat or the grease part of, of wool that's been extracted. So just something to uh, pay attention to. Uh, so there's a lot of different roles that vitamin D plays in addition to maintaining a healthy immune system. Exercise is a very key component. Uh, so they're looking at 48,000 adults over 18 that had confirmed COVID cases between January and October 2020 at Kaiser Permanente. And those who were active for at least 150 minutes per week had significantly lower risks of hospitalization, even with the confirmed COVID cases, uh, ICU admission and death after getting COVID <clears throat> than those who were not as active. And they found that even 10 minutes per week had some protective effects. So exercise affects up to 150 minutes a week or as low as 10 minutes, any kind of exercise had protective and beneficial effects. <clears throat> nutrition, if we look at the nutrition of, of the diet that was given in heaven, the original diet, uh, Genesis 129 says, then God said, I give you every seed bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. Grains, fruits, seeds, and nuts are the basis of, of the original diet. Once Adam sinned and uh, was uh, placed outside the garden, uh, then the herb of the field was added to that in Genesis 3.18. <clears throat> so it was added, the herbs of the field, uh, root vegetables, and uh, leaves were included in that uh, part of man's diet. Conspicuously absent here is animal-based sources of, of food. So the Eden diet and the, the after fall diet as originally given to man con contained no, no animal products at all. <clears throat> so it was a whole food uh, plant-based diet. The British, British Medical Journal uh, looked at a survey of over 2000 doctors and nurses exposed to COVID-19 patients and so they are working in the healthcare setting and taking care of, of patients. And they found that even with all the protective gear and everything else, there was a 73% lower risk of moderate to severe COVID-19 among those with a plant-based diet. So 73% lower risk. Your risk increased, but it was still 59% lower if you included fish in your diet. So a pescatarian is someone who is a plant-based person who also includes fish in their diet. But they found that there is a 48% greater risk of moderate to severe COVID-19 um, being contracted by those healthcare professionals who are working with their COVID patients with their protective gear among those on a ketogenic diet. Now a traditional ketogenic diet is one that's very low on carbohydrates and high on the end of, of fat and typically is uh, animal-based to a large extent. Just recently listening to a presentation, there are some benefits to uh, uh, ketosis 
that can also be achieved by being completely plant-based and getting your fats from, from plant sources like coconut oil, for example, <clears throat> and using legumes and things like that instead of the meat that a typical ketogenic diet um, uh, promotes. It'd be interesting to see um, how a uh, total vegetarian plant-based ketogenic diet uh, would rank within these statistics here, <clears throat> probably still a much lower risk uh, rather than a greater risk. Another thing that is very important to a healthy immune system is a, an intact microbiome. We're learning more and more about this, but the microbiome should be very diverse and supportive of, of, of health benefits. Um, and it actually improves with a plant-based diet and that's largely because of the fiber. The fiber is a key component of the, the, um, the food sources of our, of our gut microbiome. A low fiber diet has less material for our gut biome to thrive on. <clears throat> One and also that's low in sugar, low in salt, uh, low in, in refined oils. We need fat in our diet and we get adequate amounts of fat from uh, the fat that's in cell membranes. All plants have cell membranes, just like animal cells, and they all have uh, fat associated with them. And also avoiding pro-inflammatory foods. It turns out again that there is a plant pathway called the shikimate pathway, S-H-I-K-I-M-A-T-E. It's found in plants and glyphosate disrupts and interrupts that shikimate pathway. And that shikimate pathway disruption is one of the primary mechanisms, biochemical mechanisms of the herbicide function. While we as humans don't have the shikimate pathway in our physiology, it turns out that much of our gut microbiome does. And when we ingest trace amounts of glyphosate from Roundup and other herbicides, it interrupts the shikimate pathway of our gut microbiome and kills them. And one of the things that they produce is vitamin B12 in our gut that drives down their capacity to do that, as well as other nutrients that they are able to produce that we don't get directly from our food. We actually get them from a gut microbiome and they aid in our immune system competency to have a diverse and complete microbiome. When diversity goes down, it's an unhealthy situation. And we tend to have a, uh, a flourishing of one type of, of gut bacteria over the uh, diversity that might be pres present. And having a gut microbiome that is out of whack, uh, dysbiosis it's called, correlates with frailty. <clears throat> so that's a frail person. Uh, inflammation, neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease in elderly people. And that can be a chronic thing that has gone on throughout a person's life. It's usually not a point source kind of a thing, but more of a cumulative uh, thing. So that's why it's important to eat organic because organic produce is not subjected to herbicides. Eating non-GMO is not necessarily safe either because genetically modified organisms, plants in particular, are often made that way so that they can uh, take a pesticide or herbicide application and not die. Therefore, more is used on them. The same token, those that are non-GMO <clears throat> and um, non-organic, they may actually and they often do use it to cure those plants, um, they desiccate them or kill them at the time of harvest so that they dry uniformly. So conventional wheat, conventional dry beans, lentils, oats, rye, barley, anything conventional like that, uh, peas, beans, that's conventionally grown will likely have an herbicide um, that has glyphosate in it sprayed on it prior to harvest to increase the yield and the efficiency of their harvest. <clears throat> So there are probably more exposures to glyphosate than we ever realized uh, in the past. It's a very insidious and pervasive um, compound in our society today. 
and is probably more prevalent in the United States than anywhere else in the world. So it actually turns out that, that the use of uh, vaccines for COVID-19 lowers the genomic diversity of, of the virus. And that's been found by Neeson et al. Um, just, uh, just recently. <clears throat> So it lowers its genetic diversity and uh, it becomes um, uh, less uh, variable. This is a, a kind of a, a lot of different graphs here showing that same thing. Uh, the first graph, graph B there with the line graph. Uh, this is the diversity of the, the genetic makeup of the virus. Um, you can see that it, at its inception in 2020, January, it was increasing in diversity. Uh, but you see um, towards uh, October, November, December, at the highest point, that's about where uh, vaccine entry into the whole um, program began. And you can see the genetic diversity declining um, ever since then. And you can see that at, in various countries, the same thing with the UK, the United States, you see a general trend, look at the date line, and you can see the diversity of the genome changing and uh, reducing from its original um, original source. So several different ways of representing that here. They're causing, calling it lineage entropy. Entropy is essentially the tending toward chaos of natural systems without energy input. Um, essentially a description of entropy might be looking at your, your bedroom or maybe your house over the course of a week if you just uh, lived in it without taking any effort to put things away. It just becomes a chaotic clutter, and that's that's entropy in action. <clears throat> um, all systems require energy inputs in order to maintain order. So zinc is a nutrient that is key to <clears throat> uh, making your immune system function appropriately. Uh, it's an antioxidant. It's anti-inflammatory. It helps to stabilize cell membranes. Um, it's a, a skin barrier role um, and zinc deficiencies can decrease uh, sex hormones like testosterone, um, <clears throat> immune dysfunction, uh, hyperammonemia, uh, neurosensory disorders, decreasing muscle mass, retarding growth, and cognitive impairment. And it turns out, interestingly enough, that again, glyphosate could be a role here in uh, chelating because one of the roles of, of uh, glyphosate is functioning as a chelator or a, a compound that binds up uh, minerals and makes them inaccessible to the physiological systems that they are in, like plants or animals. So supplementing with zinc can be a benefit. Uh, overriding the amount of glyphosate that you may have in your system. And so in the, some individuals may require more than others in order to actually get some zinc um, available. But the readily available zinc may be tied up due, due to glyphosate toxicity or presence. So some foods high in zinc, uh, we need to have about 10 milligrams per day. Uh, legumes, so that's your, your uh, peas, beans, lentils, etc. Nuts, seeds, pumpkin seeds have a very high zinc content, 2.2 milligrams per ounce. Uh, pseudo grains, so like quinoa and amaranth, uh, things like that, as well as other grains are good sources of zinc. And those grains would be not refined grains, but in their whole grain um, status. Uh, the refining and bleaching of grains tends to strip away uh, all the nutrients that, um, that they have and leave them kind of a shell of their former self. They often enrich grain uh, by spraying back on various nutrients like folate uh, to the refined grains. But that's kind of like uh, someone stealing $100 from you and giving you $20 back and saying that you've been enriched. Um, by that uh, $20 you've just been given back. Quercetin is a phytochemical um, and ionophore that reversibly binds ions. So that's very interesting. So it functions as a shuttle across uh, cellular membranes. So it binds something, it carries it across, and then unbinds it. And that's a good thing in quercetin's role. It can move in appropriate um, <clears throat> minerals and agents into the body, but glyphosate actually functions as a reversibly binding agent too, in some respects. And we'll see this, uh, we've seen this in different places. Um, for example, it binds aluminum from the digestive tract 
and it gets into the circulatory system as a bound chelate. But when it gets into the, to the acidic environment of the brainstem area, it uh, releases it into the cerebral spinal fluid. <clears throat> and that's not where you want aluminum. And that could be one basis for the dementia and Alzheimer connections. So quercetin is anti-inflammatory by nature, antihistaminic. Uh, so the histamine response is an inflammatory response, an antioxidant, an anti-diabetic. So it's found in lots of things. We'll show you some of those things here in a minute. Antithrombotic. So that uh, has uh, beneficial effects on platelets, improves bone mineral content. So it's gonna shuttle calcium to the bones more effectively. Um, Anti-carcinogenic, anti-cataract, and uh, cytoprotective in the gastrointestinal tract and improves the time and rate of healing. So some foods that are high in quercetin include apples, berries, the, the brassica family of vegetables. So that's um, things like kale and broccoli and cauliflower, capers, uh, grapes, onions, shallots, uh, teas, uh, tomatoes, and many seeds, nuts, flowers, barks, and leaves. Onions have two times the quercetin of tea and three times that of apples. So an apple a day keeps the doctor away. And this is probably part of the basis of that, the fiber and the quercetin that are available in, in apples. But onions are three times better than that. So onions uh, are very, very beneficial. Um, the immune building onion broth is very helpful. Uh, three cups of water, uh, one onion cut in half, so you don't even have to chop it up, five cloves of garlic, probably want to crush those to activate the allicin in them, um, salt it with real or Celtic salt, the sea salt, you're going to get a wide uh, profile of minerals rather than using table salt that is uh, sodium chloride because those have fillers and flow agents and things like that, you want to use sea salt, um, boil it and simmer it for 20 minutes. If you have an infection, use one cup twice a day, uh, for prevention, you can use uh, one cup uh, once a day. Um, we like to add celery and onions and just make it a soup, and you can just eat it for soup. You don't have to strain off the broth. You can just eat the broth and the vegetables um, all together. Um, but you can, you can, if you can't handle the vegetable components, if you happen to be sick, the broth by itself is very uh, therapeutic and immune building. Vitamin C. Functions in antiviral roles. Um, it reduces uh, the cytokines. So we talk about cytokine storm. We've heard that term used here recently, but it reduces the presence of those in production of cytokines. It's an uh, antioxidant. So it reduces the presence of free radicals. Um, it also um, attenuates excessive activation of the immune response. So basically attenuation means it lowers overactive immune responses. Uh, so hyperactivity of the immune system is essentially a part of autoimmunity. Um, and a hyperactive immune system can uh, be detrimental to say the least. So two to eight grams a day may reduce incidence of, of respiratory infections. Um, so intravenous vitamin C, six to 24 grams may reduce mortality in particular with, uh, with COVID, but other things too, um, and may have significant uh, synergistic uh, effects with quercetin. Some sources of vitamin C, bell peppers. You can see the, the ratios there. Uh, kiwi fruit and strawberries, and then kind of on down, we have the highest at the top. Oranges, papayas. Oranges you typically think of as having, having the highest uh, or very high. They're, that's probably a PR campaign associated with that. But tomatoes, kale even has it, and snow peas have natural sources of vitamin C. <clears throat> Garlic. Garlic is a, a key uh, component. One of the components of both uh, onion and garlic is their sulfur compounds. Uh, it turns out that uh, um, glyphosate interrupts sulfation of various molecules in our body. So that's one of the things that it can tie up and that has systemic effects, negative effects. Um, so getting adequate uh, sulfates from onion and garlic can be very therapeutic and immune building. <clears throat> So the garlic lemon drink, two small cloves of garlic, the juice of half a lemon and four ounces of warm water. Take that with a, uh, a blender in a, like a, um, a pint jar, a small um, pint jar and uh, whiz it up in, in that. Um, and when you're infected, um, drink it with each meal. 
for prevention, just one time a day. So it'd be three times a day if you have some kind of infection. For preventive measures, just one time a day. When you're when you're eating it or drinking it, rather, drink it with a straw because uh, that helps to protect the teeth from the um, from the lemon. So properties of of garlic, uh, Hippocrates noted it as an anti-parasitic. Uh, also, is able to help uh, relieve colic. Um, it can be a very potent antibacterial, even when diluted down to very small parts per million. Um, antifungal roles as well, good source of several different uh, minerals, magnesium, uh, zinc, selenium, germanium, uh, vitamin C, A, and B, and various enzymes are present. Um, and antilipidemia, so it can help to lower uh, cholesterol levels. Um, it's antihypertensive, anticarcinogenic, antithrombotic, um, and an antioxidant. So oxygen free radicals are again uh, bound up and shepherded out of the system by garlic. So garlic has organosulfur compounds again, along with with uh, um, with onions, and they block viral entry into cells. Essentially, what they do is they inhibit viral RNA polymerase. So RNA polymerase uh, polymerase is, is the enzyme that links the RNA molecules. Um, the amino acids together into chains, and it interrupts the polymerase of the virus itself. <clears throat> it also inhibits reverse transcriptase. So reverse transcriptase is an enzyme that reads the code backwards and actually can allow it to code from RNA to DNA. So the way we've been told is that the mRNA is not able to affect our DNA, but in fact, it can. Um, so it all also inhibits the DNA synthesis of, uh, of virus. Um, and uh, early gene uh, transcription. <clears throat> so it downregulates extracellular signals that are, are regulated by um, a series of enzymes called kinases. Um, <clears throat> and the, the mitogen activating protein kinase signaling pathway. So it basically enhances the immune system and inhibits viral entry into um, cellular physiology. <clears throat> so the viral replication process is accelerated with, with uh, um, the main structural enzymes uh, of SARS-CoV-2. And according to a, um, a computer generated experiment, garlic may target and inhibit one of the main proteases of this uh, SARS-CoV-2. So it, it disrupts that protease. So protease is an enzyme that breaks down proteins. So in a study of effective of coronavirus in chicken embryos, so they're doing all kinds of research on various um, animal models as well. Uh, 0.1 milliliter of garlic clove extract revealed a potent in vivo, that is a living cell in its, in its um, actual living system as opposed to in a Petri dish. Uh, effects against SARS-CoV-1 multiplication, and it's probably due to the formation of blocking of structural proteins and genetic material that we talked about in its ability to block different aspects of viral um, attachment and replication. <clears throat> so when you're using garlic, you want to crush or chop the garlic because essentially that activates the enzymes alanase and it allows the formation of allicin. So allicin is actually not even present until the al alanase is activated by the crushing. So you can crush it just by chewing it, or you can crush it with the side of a knife, or crush it or break it by, by dicing it. And those sulfates, uh, sulfoxides, are allowed to um, be created and then are useful. So some natural remedies that have been found beneficial for uh, Mitigation and treatment and prevention of viral attachment and infection include charcoal, uh, one tablespoon added to, to water. Uh, just uh, put that into the water, uh, swirl it around, and you can drink it. Uh, if, if, uh, if that's too much, you can actually uh, drink a charcoal supernatant as well, which would be mixing it in, allowing it to settle, and then decant off the, the clear liquid at the top. Um, that also will have the charcoal in it, but at a much uh, uh, lower uh, concentration, but it can also be beneficial. <clears throat> Many of you have uh, are aware of the oregano oil 
uh, essential oil steam inhalation. You want pure uh, oregano oil, essential oil. So take eight cups of water boiling in a pot, uh, put two drops of, of organic uh, oregano essential oil on a spoon, and then uh, boil it for about five minutes. You can also use dried oregano leaves uh, to achieve the same result if you don't have uh, essential oil available. So if you just have the oregano leaves, that's also a way to do that. <clears throat> you can also add eucalyptus oil. Uh, and again, use a spoon. Uh, if you're gonna drop it, if you drop it directly over the pot out of your bottle, it can damage the oil that you have in your container. So do it on a spoon and then put that spoon into the, into the boiling water. Do a five to 10 minute inhalation, especially if you're sick <clears throat> for an infection. Do it every two hours uh, for prevention. One to two times is adequate. Uh, once the infection has abated, you'd want to stop. You don't want to overdo it um, because that can uh, cause some issues of its own potentially. Uh, but if you are infected, uh, every two hours is the recommended um, uh, frequency for doing the inhalation. So basically make a tent. You could do, do a tent over your head um, or just simply crack the lid and inhale the steam gently through the nose and mouth. Also an oregano water gargle, 12 ounces of water with a drop of, of pure essential oil of oregano. And if you have an infection, gargle every hour while you're awake. Uh, for prevention, three to five times a day is, is adequate. Um, also for prevention, if you've been in an area where you may have come in contact with someone uh, or a group of people, uh, I know that uh, Mercy, when she goes shopping, after she gets in the car, she takes a swish and, and uh, um, helps to clean her uh, mouth out, her oral cavity from any contamination, potential virus that she may have accounted, encountered while, while shopping. <clears throat> so rolls of oregano oil, it basically inhibits virus entry into the cells. So that'd be respiratory cells, that would be mucosal cells. Um, one, two of the primary blocking agents are carvacrol and thymol, uh, which are basically targeting <clears throat> the, uh, the fusion of the virus with the cell. So it's interrupting that ability to attach to the cells. So oregano oil is a hugely beneficial um, oil in this type of a situation. Norovirus in mice um, was found to be disrupted by exposure to oregano within one hour uh, of acting on the viral capsid. So very, very potent. Um, the Mexican oregano and uh, looking at human and animal studies in vitro. So in vitro is in the test tube. Um, they found that uh, it was very sensitive to a number of different types of, of viruses. So the oils inhibited five viruses uh, that were pre and post treated. Uh, two of the viruses inhibited were inhibited when oils were used after inoculation. Um, <clears throat> human rotavirus and bovine herpes virus type one were not inhibited by the essential oil, although um, by carbacol alone. <clears throat> um, and oregano essential oil and carbacol inhibit different viruses and may work well uh, synergistically. So hydrothermal therapy, essentially bringing your body temperature um, up and down with water therapy. So coronaviruses in general, uh, to just a class of viruses. Uh, the um, COVID-19 is a type of coronavirus. The flu virus is a coronavirus. But all coronaviruses are, are vulnerable to heat, to a, an alkaline or basic pH, and acidic pH. Uh, so on either end of neutral, our bodies are generally more neutral. A more healthy body is more alkaline. A more diseased state is more acidic in general. But an acidic state as well as a, um, a basic state is uh, in, creates an inhospitable environment for coronaviruses. Heat also has an antiviral effect in its own right. And fevers are a body's mechanism of of challenging viruses that, that may come, we may come in contact with. We can artificially elevate our body temperature uh, through sauna, through hot bath, through hydrotherapy at the surface level, um, <clears throat> hot foot baths, and that uh, type of hydrotherapy treatment. Basically, it decreases inflammation and oxidative stress and increases the white blood cell count 
and increases our hemoglobin. That's HGB. And that's the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood, which is a good thing because that allows our, our cells to uh, respire um, more adequately. <clears throat> so hydrotherapy is uh, actually fairly simple. It does take some time. Uh, and that is one of the detriments of our society is we're always seem rushed. Um, <clears throat> but if you take the time to do and use hydrotherapy, it can be very effective. Take 20 minutes to build up a very vigorous uh, sweat. So you can do that with, with exercise. Uh, so build up a sweat with exercise. <clears throat> um, then take a, a cold shower, three to six seconds, and be sure to, to apply the uh, cold water to the back of your neck. Um, in particular. Rest for at least 30 minutes and do that once a day uh, for three days from traditionalhydrotherapy.com. And that's a very kind of therapeutic way to approach that. You can also raise body temperature by taking a hot bath or a hot shower um, and then quenching with cold water. You can also use a hot foot bath, hydrotherapy again, a five gallon bucket with hot water and have more hot water on hand. Place your feet in that up to the mid calf. So that's a pretty deep bucket. And then keep the rest of your body warm. Wrap a blanket around you while you're sitting in your chair. Drink a, a diaphoretic tea uh, that encourages perspiration. Um, and uh, uh, have a cold towel for the head and cool water to drink to help um, keep your head cool. We've used this with our family, with our, our children, and uh, they like it. And it's actually very beneficial when you have, a, um, have a, a cold of any kind. Rinse the feet off with ice cold water and a, or and a friction rub and then dry thoroughly. So again, a quenching of the hot foot bath with cold water. And then take a cool shower and rest for 30 to 45 minutes or more. Um, <clears throat> if you become active too soon, it can negate the effects of the hydrotherapy. So not getting adequate rest following hydrotherapy can be detrimental. So hot and cold chest compresses with a charcoal poultice. So you can use a hot moist towel over the chest, um, cover it with plastic and a blanket to trap the heat for three minutes. Um, <clears throat> that can help to maintain the heat uh, for a longer period of time. You can also use a thermophore, which is an electric kind of uh, heating pad that doesn't have a, a cover. Uh, you don't wanna cover it with plastic. <clears throat> uh, and then after you've had a three minutes uh, uh, hot compress, take a cold towel uh, and an ice rub on the chest for 30 seconds. That sounds kind of brutal, doesn't it? But it's that contrast, the hot cold therapy that helps to bring the white blood cells uh, to the area and increase their ability to do their work. <clears throat> Repeat this three times and end with cold. Always end with cold. It's like a contrast shower. You always want to end with the cold. Um, you'll end up warming, have a warming sensation that occurs following that. You can follow that immediately with a charcoal poultice over the same area. So for example, the chest, and that's what we're talking about here, uh, the lung area, and then use that charcoal poultice uh, overnight <clears throat> and, and stay completely covered so you don't chill. Uh, always keep your head cool. Uh, you don't wanna raise the, the temperature of your head. That's one of the, the dangers of a high fever is having the head temperature get so high that it causes proteins to lose their uh, folding, their conformation, and causing denaturing of them, which can cause them to, if the hot fever is too high, it can cause brain damage. Um, but keeping your head area cool with cool water, ice water, and a cold sponge uh, can help mitigate uh, and reduce that significantly. So do it yourself sauna. 16 cups of water in a large pot, boil that. Uh, drop in uh, on a spoon, four drops of oregano and six drops of eucalyptus oil. Put those uh, uh, into the pot and stir it in with a spoon and place that next to a stool. You're gonna sit on this stool. You're gonna cover your body with a sheet um, and then a plastic like a shower curtain or maybe even a big black trash bag that's been opened up and then another sheet. So basically the, sh the plastic is gonna help retain the heat and insulate you inside your little sauna. Then stay inside, cover yourself up, cover your head with that for 20 minutes. And if you have an infection, um, do that. You're basically have the hot water in there that's off, steaming off with the uh, essential oils of oregano and uh, eucalyptus in it um, and uh, creating a little mini sauna for you. If you have a uh, 
three times a week is, is beneficial for prevention, uh, twice a day if you have an infection. And it's very effective for severe illness. So it's something you can do at home. Everything is readily available. Um, you don't have to go anywhere uh, to necessarily get uh, the things other than eucalyptus and oregano. Uh, <clears throat> we don't grow oregano, or not oregano, but eucalyptus in the northern climates, but other parts of the country may actually have eucalyptus growing. Anybody can grow um, oregano and use even just uh, raw oregano if necessary. Onion poultices, chop the onion into small to medium sized pieces, use a saucepan with just a little bit of water so that you can uh, steam it and soften it. And uh, you don't want it to get to be too soft, but then place that cooked onion into a thin dish towel and wrap it up. You can place it on a t-shirt and wear that tight t-shirt to keep it in place um, overnight <clears throat> as, you, as you wear it on the chest area. So that's using it on, on the chest itself or other thoracic um, areas that might need an onion poultice. <clears throat> you can use it as an air freshener, essentially using half an onion um, near areas where you spend time, like your bed, and it will not only freshen the air, but uh, tend to um, take up any pathogens that may be um, in the air. Cooked or raw, um, half of onion applied to the ear is an excellent uh, earache remedy, drawing out um, the agents of inflammation from an earache. <clears throat> so the COVID protocol is uh, essentially stay healthy with the principles of wholeness, um, eat and live to glorify God. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 31, do all to the glory of God and uh, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. We're not our own. We're purchased with a price, the price of the Son of God. Um, and if we destroy the temple that, that the Holy Spirit is living in, um, the temple, he who destroys the temple will be destroyed is what um, the Bible says as well. So be consistent with your diet and your lifestyle. <clears throat> a plant-based diet, a whole foods plant-based diet is, is vitally important. And we've seen that even eating just fish lowers your ability to resist disease uh, by approximately 25%. <clears throat> Pray for wisdom. Go way back there. Um, if any of you lacks wisdom, um, ask of God. So Isaiah 30, 21. So natural means used in accordance with God's will bring about supernatural results. We ask for a miracle, and the Lord directs the mind to some simple remedy. We ask to be kept from the pestilence that walketh in darkness, that is stalking with such power through the world. We are then to cooperate with God, observing the laws of, of health and life. 